Welcome everybody back to Shinky University. So excited to have you here today. I'm going to go through the three tips that I think are super important to have both an effective and specific and accurate bloodletting technique. It's kind of a controversial topic, but I love bloodletting. So I'm really excited to have you all here. And just to let you know, this is a little bit of a sneak peek of the more full video that I'm making actually right now for the members of Shink University. So in Shink University, we go through techniques one by one in, in depth um, at, at length for sure. Um, and bloodletting is a whole topic that I really, really enjoy. I really love. It's a very powerful form of our medicine. Um, so this is just a condensed version of that video. If you're interested in learning more about bloodletting, shonishin, moxibustion, acupuncture, then you really want to head over to shinkyouni.com or go into the description box below and click on the link to set up your interview. Shink University is a lifetime membership and mentorship program that is all about bridging the gap between your TCM skills and the foundations of Japanese medicine. So you can be even more powerful in the clinic with your clients and be just a little bit more effective um, and efficient when learning from Japanese masters of 20, 30, 40 years. So don't forget to set up that interview. I'm really excited to talk to you about you and your goals. When you do have that interview, you will have a live person, usually myself talking with you, um, all about you and your desires for your practice. So just be prepared to have a conversation and get really in depth about acupuncture. Without further ado, let's get into it. My top three tips for creating an accurate, efficient, and precise bloodletting technique that is a higher efficacy. So the very first thing is we have to cover before we even get into the tips um, is covering the correct tools to use um, and really the tools that I love to use, I should say, rather than the correct tools. Now, I really do prefer to use a MediPoint. Um, doesn't really matter about the brand, but this kind of Lancet, I don't know if that's in focus. There we go. Um, this kind of Lancet tool, they're, for one, they're just really, really cheap. Um, I don't use the classical versions of Lancet tools simply because I don't have an autoclave in my office and we are dealing with blood here with bloodletting, right guys? So we, we really should be careful about the tools that we use. So I prefer to use something that I can throw away rather than a classical tool. Although more than likely those classical tools are probably more, infe more effective. Um, it's just not worth the effort for me. So I always use a, a blood lancet tool. I know a lot of people tend to use um, little, they're like little teeny green, um, thumbtacks and they're used for diabetics usually to take the blood out of their fingertips. I don't really encourage using those and the reason why is because of tip one and that is know your tool. Each and every acupuncture needle is made with one of three tip types or a variation of one of these threes. One is the sword type. Now, the sword type is a very specific kind of tool, tool tip, I should say. The sword type is a very specific kind of tool tip. Now, this isn't exactly a sword type. This is um, actually a Daishiru style shonishin, but you can see that the tip of this is quite, quite pointy. Um, what would be different really for a true sword type is that rather than having this, oh, it's not focused, there we go, there we go. Um, rather than having a soft edge as it comes down from the tip, it would be more of like an actual sword. So it would kind of look like a hard edge. So the reason why you would have a sword type or what we would call in Japanese a suryoroshi is simply that um, the suryoroshi is going to make a sharp cut and that's going to stop. It's not going to be able to be inserted more deeply. So this is a very typical tip. Now, if we look at our blend lancet tool, that looks very similar, right? There's actually there's actually like a really sharp edge there that stops that tool from going in farther. So this is definitely a suryoroshi type. I really love this more so than the diabetic um, little pins because with the diabetic pins, you have to go through the entire shaft before it butts up into the, um, the, the hole there. And also rather than having a an edge that's like, cut here it's just straight and so it's really easy it's actually a lot easier to go in deep really quickly without noticing it um, and just not be as accurate so again we want to be precise accurate 
and efficient with all of our techniques, but with our bloodletting technique, of course. So what we're going to do is know our tools. And so um, we're not going to use anything that isn't a suryoroshi usually for bloodletting. Um, and then we're also going to understand the tip of the tool. So the tip of the tool, depending on how it's made, cannot be made quite as well. Now, if you look at the, um, what I would say is the more common used little pin, what I'm referring to, which is this guy right here, you can see that it has, usually it's like um, two edges that are connected to each other and then the back of it is round, right? And so when the what happens there is if it's not at the right angle, then it actually is really painful when it's inserted. So I kind of explain this to all of my students that you wanna make sure that the flat edge and the very point of that flat edge is the first thing to go in, not the rounded part of the needle. The rounded part of the needle should be away from the skin because it's going to make a more um, painful cut as it goes in because it's not sharp on that side. So with those little teeny pins, a lot of people don't realize that there's a specific direction in which they should be going into the skin with. And if you're not holding it correctly, then it actually ends up being more painful because you're pushing in a round edge rather than a sharp edge that's going to cut through the skin. You're pushing in a rounded edge that um, was going to push against the skin and push tissue away rather than just cutting it open. So that can be quite painful for the client. Um, also, in the past, I've seen with those diabetic pins that they're there is an edge that is flat for you to hold it correctly. Actually, it's really those go into a machine, but there is a specific edge which you could hold it flatly. Some of the more flat, flat, whatever. <laughs> but the newer ones that I've seen, actually they didn't have those edges um, to sp specify how to hold it. So another thing that I don't really like about the pins is that they're just so darn tiny. So I have really, really big hands. I have hobbit hands, I like to say. They're just really, really large. Um, and so it's difficult for me to hold such a small tool correctly. So that leads me into my second tip, and that is make sure you're holding your tool correctly. Now, of course, with all technique, we want to make sure with blood, of course, that we're going to be using gloves. We're going to be clean about it. Use your alcohol, clean needle technique, the whole bit. So we're not going to go over this here. I think you guys all have that. Instead, Let's talk about how to hold the tool correctly because there is a right and wrong to this. I'm going to be using my needle pillow here, which is something I made in acupuncture school at Toyo Shinkyu um, to just practice on. But you can use a piece of fruit. Actually, apples and oranges are great things to practice on. In particular, I love apples for bloodletting because when you cut the skin, you can see how deep you cut. And we'll get into the depth and accuracy here in a second. Okay, so there is a right and wrong to holding these tools. So when we hold our tool, we can see it in particular with these blood lancets, it's a little easy to see because on one side, they're going to have like raised bumps that you can feel. Not sure if you can hear that in the video, but there's gonna be like a raised bump. And then on the other side, it's actually going to be a little bit concave. So the side that has the bumps is actually convex and the side that is a little that doesn't have the bumps bumps is um is actually concave. So the concave side of your tool always goes against the middle and index finger of your dominant hand. And we're going to move it back just a little bit so that the tip of the tool is actually going to line up with the tip of my middle finger here. So it looks a little bit like that. And the reason for that is because, again, I would normally have gloves on in this in, in this situation, but the, the pad of my index finger is actually going to act as a cushion, but also as a guide for me to understand how deep I'm putting my tool in. So if I hold my tool the same way every single time, it also allows me to be more precise by taking away some of the variables. So every single time, I'm gonna make sure again to hold my tool along the index and the middle finger on an angle so that the convex, uh, excuse me, concave side is against your hand and that the tip of the tool always lines up with the tip of the pad of your finger, just like that. So that's, and then what we do is we use our thumb to create a little bit of pressure. Now, if you put more pressure that's closer to the tip, it's gonna make that tip go into, kind of be pressed into the pad of your finger. And if I hold a little bit away and a little bit lighter with my thumb, it's going to allow the tip of that tool to kind of float off my finger a little bit to show you a little bit. Obviously, we wouldn't do this much, but um, just to show you how that works. 
So that is tip number two, right? Tip number one was know your tool. Tip number two, hold your tool correctly. Tip number three. Tip number three is to do the proper movement precisely every single time. So let me show you how to do this for close up and then I'll show you far away. So let's say that I want to, I have a handy dandy little dot here that I put when I was in school for my accuracy. Always wanna get it right on the dot. And I'm gonna line up right on the dot. Notice that I have my hand at a very specific angle. I'm gonna have my dantian about in line with my belly button. Honestly, I'd wanna be just a little bit higher if I could to have a downward angle from my elbow to my wrist. But just for the sake of showing you, I'm gonna be sitting here. Um, and then I always have my hand resting with my tip right in line with what I want to treat. And I'm going to just rotate my hand, make it vertical, and that's going to insert into my cushion. So let's show you that a little bit far closer up. Again, I'm going to line my tool up with what I want to treat. If I rotate my hand out, you see how my point of my, my tool gets a little farther away, so it's harder for me, to be, for me to be as accurate. So always line up exactly where you wanna be, kind of floating above the skin. And then when they breathe out, you can rotate your hand up. So do you see how my knuckle is now pointing upwards, right? And then I lift up. So it's having this snap. Always making more emphasis on the uptake. So let me show you how what that looks like with my whole body. Now I'm gonna show you what it looks like with my whole body in the frame so you can kind of see what the motion would look like. Now normally I'm not gonna have my hand right here next to it. You actually don't need this if you do your technique correctly. However, there are times when, for example, there's loose skin or um, there's a lot of fat in the area that you might have to spread the tissue out to be more exact about where you're doing things. But really, if you line yourself up like this and do the correct snap up, you're gonna be more accurate for sure. So just to make sure my mine is a little bit, through years of use, a little bit dented, so I'm gonna hold it in place so it doesn't rock. I'm gonna breathe in. And with my patient, breathe out and pull up. Now notice I have a nice round posture every time and all I'm doing is rotating my hand up and then pulling up. Now if I want to have a shallower cut because again this needle the lance I'm using has a triangle tip that looks like this so if I don't put my hand all the way vertical if I for example stop my hand right here I'm going to have maybe just a fourth of the tip be able to be inserted. If I go right here it's going to be a half of the tip if I go right here, a full rotation, then I can have a full insertion of that tip and have a much deeper and wider cut. So depending on what you're wanting to bleed, whether that's a spider vein, or um, let's say it's a lot of excess, or there is, for example, swelling in the knee, or if you're just going to the tips of the toes, right? Depending on where you're at, you're gonna to need to have a deeper cut or a more shallow cut. I would say for most people who are doing just um, the tip of the ear or they're doing the tips of the fingers and toes, you're gonna to wanna to be very shallow with that cut. Make sure you just use the tip of your needle and don't make it too wide because that's gonna make it quite painful. Now, for those who are ShinQ members, we'll be going into a lot more of how to use this technique, when to use this technique, so if you're interested in learning more about the application or the situational, you know, when to use this technique, when shouldn't you use these techniques? Like how about for headache, when do I use it? When can I use bloodletting for pregnant people? When can I use bloodletting on um, really serious situations like, for example, is it helpful for neuropathy or is it helpful for back pain? Like in what situation do I use this? In what state can the patient be in? For all of that, we're going to go into it in Shinku University. So if you're interested in learning more about that, then I highly recommend, again, go into the description box below and you're going to want to click on make my interview now and we'll see if the membership and mentorship is a good fit for you and your practice. But for today, just to review, we reviewed three techniques to make your bloodletting technique more specific, accurate, and efficient. And those are, number one, know your tool. Super important to know what kind of tool you're using 
and to know when to use what tool, right? The second is to hold your tool correctly. And the third is to utilize your tool correctly with the proper technique of your physical body. And for anybody who's watching this channel, been watching my channel here for a while, you know that one of the biggest things that I really stress, and I know my teacher stressed, is that you have to be a clinician um, only after you become a technician. So that means that you have to be accurate, specific, and efficient at every single technique you do, making the same movements every time, so that eventually you can augment those techniques and augment what you're doing for the patient on front of, in front of you. And that's really what a clinician is. Thank you so much for watching till the end. I really appreciate you all coming here and learning and geeking out about acupuncture, in particular Japanese acupuncture and moxibustion with me. Now, if you're interested about how to start your moxibustion practice, then you're gonna wanna go watch this video right here as it's kind of amazing and you're gonna learn how to create your direct moxa practice by rolling with your hands. Thanks so much for watching. See you guys next time and happy practicing.